this short video, we're going to be focused on the safety and regulations of laser therapy. Uh, my name is Nelson Marquina. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Laser Biotech International. I have been training doctors in many different countries uh, from Japan, China, Australia, Argentina, and so on. The, my PhD is in engineering, so I'm uh, uh, focusing also on being a professor in engineering and biophysics in different universities. I work for uh, GE Aerospace as an engineer in Honeywell, NASA, and so on. My master's degree is in statistics. I also have a doctorate degree in chiropractic. Let's move on into the agenda right now. We're going to be talking about the classification, the relevance for laser therapy. How do we classify lasers, but from the, from the perspective of laser therapy only? Then we're going to talk about the laser safety for goggles. It's specific to read, how to read the rating system. So when you're purchasing your safety goggles, you know what you're buying at that point. Of course, we have to look at what causes tissue damage or what could cause tissue damage and why. So once we understand that, then we can uh, uh, make a decision on what kind of safety goggles are required for your specific laser and for your specific applications. We have to look at both. Then we need to address the issues of, well, how much laser energy is too much? So well, what's kind of, how, how do you understand the threshold, the threshold between safety and, and the risk being high in terms of laser therapy. And what I end up finishing up with talking about the uh, regulations at the federal level through the FDA and at the state level. Look at the differences and what applies to you in your specific case. So let's start with the classification of lasers and the relevancy for laser therapy. What makes sense? So classification. The FDA, of the, the, the organizations that regulate and classify lasers in the U.S., of course, we have the FDA's, what's called the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Notice the name, it's a Center for Devices. It doesn't talk about therapies or protocols. It has nothing to do with the application of lasers. Their, their sole focus is devices, and that's it. The next organization we have in the U.S. is the Occupational Safety and Health Organization, OSHA, and international is the IEC. Very important organization from the manufacturer's perspective, the International Electrotechnical Commission. So you will see perhaps in some laser companies advertising, yes, we have the IEC and give you a number. In the U.S., what's important is the FDA, of course. And you will see companies saying, yes, we have the uh, clearance for this laser, and they call it 510K. I'll, I'll discuss in, in a moment what that means between clearance and the 510K and versus approval. Very important distinction. So let's start with the FDA. So let's say we have the laser product hazards, and we have numbers, okay? So classes, class one, uh, for example, class one is defined as non hazardous except when viewed through optical aids. It's like a magnifying lens. Otherwise, plus one doesn't do anything at all by itself. Uh, so that's how we have, to, in fact, some lasers uh, sold in the US for therapy, they're classified as class one. So that tells you that uh, it doesn't do much. And 2A and class two, it has to, but only if you view for a long time, like 1,000 seconds, that's where the FDA threshold it is. Over, that's a lot, of course. You know, you're staring at it, 1,000 seconds. Of course, or with optical aids, like a magnifying lens. Yeah, magnifying lens will increase intensity, so that's more, increases the focusing, so that could be dangerous. Class 3A can be viewed, but just briefly, like a laser pointer, for example. It's, you're not going to go blind if, if somebody flashes a laser pointer over your eyes. But again, the emphasis is the amount of time. Time is an issue because the amount of uh, laser energy over time accumulates. So it could be dangerous in that sense. Class 3B is okay, but if you less than a quarter of a second, meaning again, so it's just passing by accidentally. But it must have a, an average, AP stand for average power, less than half a watt, okay, or less than 500 milliwatt, same thing. Or the energy density, that EV stands for energy density, 10 joules per square centimeter. So it's either or, 
one of the two. And the distinction, of course, is the average power is the amount of laser coming out, the emission. But the dose takes into account the joules, which is the measure of energy per square centimeter, meaning the, the intensity of the energy delivered. And uh, that has a, a name, we call it the dose, energy density. A little more details about that. Then class four is the highest class, that's called exposure higher than 3B, which is higher than half a watt average power, okay? So according to the FDA, it says, I hazard from exposure, risk of fire. But again, this notice this is all based on danger, risk to the eye, the retina in particular. Classes one, two A, two, and three A from laser therapy perspective are worthless. The power is so low that you can't do much with it. Uh, unless you're doing maybe acupuncture treatments, then that would be okay. Acupuncture all requires about 10 milliwatts of power and that, that should be enough. But even then, this, this list, like class one, forget it. So for acupuncture, we're going to look in the class 3A. Less than that, you're not getting any results. So let's focus on class 3B and class 4. So let me point it out on the next line. Here we have class 3B. Remember, that uh, has to be less than half of what average power or 10 joules per square centimeter energy density or less than that. Okay. Class 4 is, is higher than those numbers. The uh, 0.5 watt in the average power. So let's notice that the classification based on risk of eye damage, it has nothing to do with therapeutic effectiveness. Absolutely none. This is all based on what, of course, the eye, the retina is, is the most sensitive, light sensitive organ in the body. So that's the reason why all these classes are based on risk to the retina of the eye meaning that's the worst case possible in the whole body. But obviously we're not treating eyeballs. In laser therapy, more like we're treating joints, muscles, you know, uh, meniscus, tendon, tendon, ligaments, and so on. We're not treating eyeballs. So this, this classification is meaningless from the laser therapy perspective. In fact, the marketing statement, class four laser therapy is meaningless, actually it's even misleading. They, they, that doesn't make sense at all. There's no such a thing as a class four laser therapy. All right, let's move on to laser safety goggles. That's important. Let's, let's see how to read the rating system, the numbers. All right. To do that, before that, I wanted to mention because wavelength is an important factor. Wavelength, absolute, for from the laser goggles, the safety perspective, is driven by the wavelength. All right. Let me just introduce the Lumix because we have. That's what we're talking about. We have the desktop unit for 45 watt pulse power and the floor unit comes in 100 watt or 250 watt pulse power. The wavelengths, let's focus on that. All those two lasers, all, all our uh, Mo Lumix models actually, they all come with up to four wavelengths. You can have 650, 810, 910, 980, or 1064, but it could be two of them, three of them, or four of them. The pulse rate goes up to 100,000 pulses per second, average power from half a watt. So you see they're all um, class four lasers because they go from half a watt up to 35 watts, average power. Pulse power, the small one is 45 watt, and the uh, desktop unit can be either a model of 100 watt or 250 watt pulse power. Let's focus on the wavelengths. So the, let me actually show it. Um, it's a range that we need to worry about that, okay? So let me give you an example. Uh, safety goggle may give you a range saying 720 to 1090 nanometer. So that's the range the, for the protection. That means any wavelengths, any laser that has a wavelength or wavelengths that fall between 720 and 1090, you're okay with those safety goggles. The next example, it's a different example, they have multiple ranges, which is the most common by the way. In this case, has 190 to 534, gives you a number, a rating number. I'm, I'm not listing it here now. I'll show you in a moment what those numbers mean. Then the next range could be 730 to 10. You see, it's not continuous. It skips. So you have to be careful about that. You have to make sure that the, the, the intervals listed in, in the safety cover the, the wavelengths you're using your laser. So this particular second example goes up to 1064 and then skips 
covers the 10,600, 10,600. 10,600 is a CO2 gas laser, okay? 1064 is a neodymium uh, YAG laser. And below that, they're all diodes, the 730s. So, so, so from 730 to 1064, that will cover all, uh, all the Lumix lasers except 650, okay? So let's see here. Something else that two numbers you need to look at, you know, how much is blocking the infrared. And the second number, the VLT, is the visible light transmittance. It means how light or how dark the lenses are. All right, so we will look at those two numbers. OD is the level of protection. So, for example, give you a four, five, three, some numbers like that. Okay, that means the higher the number, the higher the level of protection. So that's the optical density to the infrared. So, if, for example, uh, seven, that's a very high level of protection for the infrared emissions to the eye. The VLT is a percentage of visible light. What you do there, visible light transmitted. So, so how light the, the goggles are. That could be a percentage, of course, is a percentage of the visible light. 100% will be full visible light. That's not possible, of course. The, uh, so 32%, that's, that's reasonable. The lower the number, the darker the goggles. The higher the percentage, the lighter it will be. You can see better what's going on. Ideal, of course, we want to see a lot, but high protection. And unfortunately, the, the two extremes are not possible. Uh, you, you, many times you will notice in, in the safety, in the examples, if you do some searching around for safety goggles, it's a compromise between high level of protection and lower visibility. You may have high visibility, but the protection become more difficult. And the, the, when it's high for both of them, high protection are highly visible. You will notice that the price is much, much higher, expensive goggles. You can be spending $300, $400 for a pair of safety goggles. Let's look at some examples. This goggle, this is covered in 720 to 1090. So this is uh, it's, uh, from England, 125 pounds. But let's look at this. Laser protective eyewear, 720 to 1090. So you have to make sure your, your infrared lasers fall into that, okay? Optical density, notice. At 1064 is high, seven. But at 7.30 to 10.90, it's only five. Nothing wrong with five. Five is still very good, actually. Uh, even four is good. 7.20 to 10.90 is four. Notice the intervals overlap. But he's saying that if you go as low as 7.20, which is fairly red now, you're, you're in the, the red domain, uh, the density, the optical density protection is down to four. And down on the other extreme, Okay, the UV side, ultraviolet side, the protection is five for this particular safety goggles. And then there's a study of the visible light transmission, 30%, 34%. That's very good, actually. So you can see fairly well, 34%. And look at the safeties are fairly good. It gives you an idea about the, say, the price. It's about $200 or so. Uh, well, this is a little older. Um, by then, maybe a little more than $200. But this would be a good safety goggles if your infrared laser emissions fall into, the, into that, those intervals, okay? Let's look at another one. This one says uh, uh, two intervals, the 10, uh, 190 to 534, and it skips to 740 to 1090. So again, let's see, let's look at the, the uh, it does cover up to 10,600, oh, by itself. Two intervals and also cover the CO2 gas laser. So the optical density, that's fairly, very high, actually, very nice. So seven for the uh, UV section. Um, as you get close to covering the red port, the yellow portion, the visible, that's an uh, optical density of six. Then the near infrared, 730 to 740, that's a small sliver that says, it's kind of a borderline between red and infrared. It's an uh, optical density of five. And then beyond that is an optical density. So this is a fairly good protection. But the visible light transmission is only 11%. So it's very dark, very dark goggles. And this is 175 pounds. One last example. This is a different company. This is give you the uh, different ranges, 500 to 750. So it covers the red light, a lot of the visible 
uh, the optical density is 0.5 which is not bad. Again, the optical density in the visible is not so damaging. The main area you need to worry about is the infrared, because the infrared is not visible. So we don't have the pupillary reflex. So when we see a bright light, visible light, then you know, normally we have a reaction to it, right? The pupil will constrict and we tend to blink, you know, close, close the air. So, so the visible, there's no worry. 0.5%, 0.5 optical density is okay for the visible side. Is the infrared we wanted to worry. This is seven plus, so that's very good. All right, let's move on now. Let's kind of get an idea, conceptually. What causes tissue damage with laser? What could cause? You know, of course, it doesn't do that all the time, but let's understand what are the circumstances. The key for damage is absorption. It's like any form of energy. Energy has to be absorbed for something to happen. Okay, so the same thing happens in, in lasers. So here we have laser beam going in. Some of it will reflect back, bounce it back from the skin. Some of it will penetrate right below the skin and it scatters, you know, bounces around. Some of it will be transmitted all the way through. The key is what's absorbed because the absorption have to be absorbed by the tissue to produce the stimulation, the production of ATP and some other things. Um, so absorption is the key from the biostimulation perspective. In fact, the same, same thing is true for surgery. Laser has to be absorbed by the tissues, so the laser can cut the tissues. It will be the same, same idea. Absorption is key. No absorption, forget it. Nothing's going to happen. So the laser obviously has to reach the target tissue for the target tissue to absorb it. No? So that's... Uh, like it's called the first law of photochemistry. So let's look at the, the absorption for the different tissues. So wavelengths is key for the absorption of different tissues. So let me give you the, what's called the therapeutic window. Because from the wavelength from about 700 to about 1100, that's the therapeutic window. Because we're talking about uh, laser therapy, okay, or, or photobiostimulation, PBM. Let me just overlay, we have the relative absorption on the vertical axis and wavelengths on the horizontal axis. I'm going to overlay just two types of tissues that are very, very important for us, hemoglobin in the blood and water. So now let me overlay common wavelengths in the, that we have available. It does very common all across the country, actually, in the U.S. 650, the red light, red laser. A10, anything beyond about 780 or so, you can call it infrared, okay? So we have A10, 910, 980, 1064. They're all near infrared uh, wavelengths. So they look at how this absorbed by the different substances in the body. 650 readily absorbed by hemoglobin in the, in the blood. And then notice uh, 980 is readily absorbed by water, interstitial fluid, or any, any water content in the blood. Could be, a, you know, lymphedema, swelling, and all that. Let's look at now what damages tissue. So when the lace is absorbed, then, or not only then, the light is converted to heat. When tissue absorbs energy faster than it can dissipate, so imagine this tissue. The laser comes into it, and the tissue absorbs it, okay? Because when the, the, the tissue is absorbing energy, it's, it's creating a thermal activity. What happens is the tissue cannot dissipate thermal activity fast enough. If the tissue is absorbing energy faster than it can dissipate the, that, that thermal activity, there, then it will, the heat will build up. So that's exactly what happens. So this is in general. So what are the ways that typically happens in terms of laser therapy? that perhaps we're pumping so much energy way too fast for the type of tissue we're talking about, all right? If we have an excess absorption with low penetration, for example, the tissue volume is low, you have a laser that doesn't penetrate very deep. It's absorbed a lot on the superficial side, and we have a lot of absorption on that level. Yes, you can have a burn. We can have a damage at the skin level. So that could be... For, uh, I showed the previous chart, for example, the 980. 980 is absorbed readily by water. And so we have a capillary bed right under the skin. So it has you know, a lot of water and hemoglobin, but water in particular for the 980. So then, yes, the 980 will get hotter than the other lasers. So if you have an excess absorption, if you have a 980 and you stay in one spot only, uh, a certain wattage, then that, that could uh, cause some damage.
So high thermal conversion of laser emission, that will be, again, that will be the absorption of light converting into heat. Excess energy density as a function of the spot size. I'll talk about in a moment the, the effects of that and treatment time. You see, the spot size, the smaller the spot size, the more intense the light is. So that, that, that's what, in fact, a surgical laser, all there is, it has a reasonable power. You should know it can be two, three watts only, not, not more than that. But the spot size is very, very tiny. So that all that two, three watts, four watts, is concentrated in the small little spot. And that's how we can use enough heat to cut the tissue. Surgical lasers cut tissues because they get hot enough. It's just like a hot rod. Same thing for treatment time, of course, if you hold up uh, a laser for a long time in one spot only without moving. Yeah, after a while, the heat will build up and that, would, that could cause uh, tissue damage. This, let me, I'm going to have some little graphics on this particular section, how the time and spot size will affect the energy density in a moment, okay? The bottom line here, energy density and power density are the risk factors. It's not power, it's not air and energy. It is not. So somebody said, oh, I have a 30-watt laser. It's just going to be dangerous. No, 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 no. It depends how you use it. That's, so it's, it's really power density that counts because power density is the power divided by the spot size. That we have to look into in context. I Many some companies says, don't use class four lasers because they're dangerous. That's not true. It is not true. It is how it's used. Yes, the risk is higher, so you have to be more aware of that. So we will talk about it in a moment. So that statement of class four lasers are dangerous, it can hurt, with burn tissues, that's not, that's not a true statement. We have to address in terms of energy density and or power density only, not just powering isolation. That's incorrect. So let's look at graphically what happens. But we have to remember power density is just the average power divided by the spot size. Okay, so the, the, the size of the beam itself as it touches the skin. And the energy density, all there is is the power density calculated above times the treatment time. Notice time shows up only when it comes to energy. Power is always per second. Is the, in fact, average power is the amount of laser per second. Okay, that's the way to think about it. Is, is the amount of juice per second. But energy is taking into account the time factor, how long you're holding the, the, the handpiece uh, how long the treatment time itself. Then you multiply that to the power density, then you get the energy density or the dose. That's what we're talking about. So let's do graphically what's how that works. There's average power, power density, and energy density. Yes, so the spot size can affect the power, the average power in the production of power density. If we decrease the spot size, that will increase the power density, obviously, because the power the spot size is a, is, is a number that shows up in the denominator. So the smaller the denominator in the formula, the higher the power density. Now, treatment time, that will be a little bit different. That's how long we, take, we hold the handpiece. If we increase the treatment time, of course, that will increase the dose because it's multiplying. See, treatment time is multiplying the power density to obtain the energy density. So I just wanted to graphic it to get a feeling for what it is. You know, we, were talking, we don't have to talk about numbers, but you want to see the risk factors. The spot size, yes, is, that's probably the biggest issue that we have to worry about that. How much laser energy is too much? Well, but there's no specific number because again, it's not the energy, it's the energy density or the power density that hurts. A lot of people think it's, power hurts or energy hurts. No, no, that is not the case. That is not the case. So let's look at that. Excess laser energy density can cause tissue damage. Let's look at a couple of examples. The spot size is too small for the thermal energy. So let's suppose we have a protocol. It costs for 1,000 joules. Well, yeah, 1,000 joules based on your laser, you can estimate how many seconds it's going to take, right? Because, because of the formula. Energy, all it is energy is, is average power times number of seconds of the treatment. So that we can look at it that way. The spot size, we have a small spot size and we're st staying in one spot, 
that can create a thermal damage in that particular area. Too much treatment time for the type of tissue. Well, then we have to look at that. Maybe if it is a bursa, well, that's, that's, that's a lot of fluid in there. And as you noticed before, the water is, is a high absorption rate, okay, relatively speaking anyway, compared to ligament or tendons or you know, discs or something like that. Nerves and muscles are different. So you have to look at the type of tissues based on the amount of treatment time. Some tissues you have to kind of move the handpiece a little bit more, a little bit faster than other tissues. Using too high of a pulse rate for the condition. In the case of super pulse laser, for example, the, uh, you, you can have, say, an 80,000 pulses per second. It could irritate acute injury. Like I said before, there's a way of using high average powers, a way of using high energy dose, energy density and dose, and same thing, there's a way of using appropriately and safely high pulse rates. Now, let's look at the signal for concern. Let's suppose you're using a treating a particular patient, and you see the patient reports a prickly heat sensation during treatment. That tells you that there's a heat buildup. If that's the case, you may either lower the power for that patient. Again, patients, they have different sensations, different ways of absorbing the laser. There's no one number that is good for everybody. You can't. People come in different sizes, colors, and all that. So, they, but they, in general, they have a prickly heat sensation. That means the, it, there's a heat buildup. So you may want to either move the handpiece a little faster, or and or lower the average power. Red skin respond during treatment. Well, because that's not a good idea. That means there was too much thermal activity already in the skin that produced the redness. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't reach go to a point of the blister situation. In fact, if, if the patient you see a blister and the patient didn't report pain, there's a bigger problem. You have a bigger problem than the blister, right? But that would be more of a, a clinical issue why the patient is not reporting pain. In some few, few very few patients, but it, it could happen, you have the increased stiffness. If you're treating, say, a joint, at the end of the treatment, it says it's a temporary situation, may last you know, a couple of hours or something, but it may show up in there, very few, but it, it does show up. Again, some patients may report the flare-up after the treatment. Again, it may last a few hours, and the patient may call you back or the following visit. Yeah, doc, you know, the, after the laser therapy, I felt a little worse, actually, but it lasted only for a couple of hours. But after that, I felt a lot better. So that's, you know, that's what I'm talking about. So that's many times it's, it's a positive sign, but you have to work with the patient to alert them. Okay, now let's move to the agenda. We're going to focus now the regulations, both federal and state. FDA clearance versus approval. We may have to make sure that this is crystal clear now between the two things. FDA uses what's called the 510K clearance process to clear medical devices like therapeutic lasers. Therapeutic lasers, fall, all, all of them fall into this uh, category, the 510K clearance. In fact, there's something called the FDA approval process. It's called PMA. Not 510K, it's called PMA. But that is not necessary for therapeutic lasers. It's just uh, the word approval sounds a lot stronger, right? That's uh, the, 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 the FDA is endorsing something. So that's kind of misleading. Uh, that's, that's not, in fact, it's not appropriate. Therapeutic lasers are cleared by the FDA, not approved. But some companies are still using that claim. They call it FDA approved. Uh, it's illegal to claim that, actually, if it's been only cleared by the FDA. But for marketing reasons, some companies use the word approved. It, it sounds a lot nicer, right? Uh, in fact, I did that, a little search on the uh, internet, and I found one. Uh, there are several companies doing that, but let me choose one example. In the FAQs, one of the questions was, uh, is MLS laser therapy approved by the FDA? The answer on the on the on their website said yes. The FDA has approved the use of MLS laser therapy, and it is also patented via the U.S. Patent Office. Well, there are two issues right there in that statement. I hope by now you can be able to spot there. Be a critical consumer when you go into a website because there's so many things are claimed on the website that uh, many of them are not are not correct actually misleading. The FDA has approved the use of MLS laser therapy. I mentioned at the beginning that the FDA, the CDRH, 
the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. They don't care about therapies at all. All they care about is devices, and that's it. Is the device safe? Is the device effective? Not the therapy. So that's kind of uh, something you can read in between the lines in there. And they were approved. Yeah, the FDA doesn't approve this kind of therapy lasers. They clear, but it sounds a lot better, right? FDA approved. So that was uh, from the uh, cutting edge website on December the 5th. So who regulates the use of lasers then? If it's not the FDA, the FDA doesn't get involved in the use of lasers, doesn't get involved in the therapy itself, all right? Only the state boards can do that. Depends on your state. I'm in Virginia, and uh, so the Virginia Board of Medicine uh, manages and controls and supervises the medical doctors, osteopaths, chiropractors, believe, uh, I forgot who else, but I know uh, at least those professions. Dentists have their own state board separately and so on, okay? An example, what happens? An MD, a medical doctor, can use the Lumix laser to treat bone fractures, but a doctor of chiropractic cannot do that. So this is an example how the state regulates who can do what, not the FDA. Why not? Well, the specific laser application must be in the purview of the practitioner using the device. So it's the scope of practice. The, that, at least in Virginia, it could be in some of the states. I'm not familiar with all the 50 states. But as far as I know, in many states, uh, doctor of chiropractic can't treat fractures. That's a medical condition. And that must be treated by a medical doctor or, or a DO, a doctor of osteopathy. So that's in one case where the device is exactly the same, but what the practitioner can do or cannot do depends on the scope of practice that is determined by the state board. The FDA has nothing to do with that. All right, let's kind of summarize what's happening here. Energy density could cause tissue damage depending on the spot size and the treatment time. So how you deliver the laser. You can have the same amount of energy, but if you deliver it too fast in a small spot, that can cause a burn, okay? If it is uncomfortable to the patient, you can deliver exactly the same dose, same amount, but you can, you can increase the treatment time in this case or reduce the average power, increase the treatment time and be safer that way. Pulse power, and wavelengths drive tissue penetration. So we need those two things at the same time. So that's in a sense, we want to penetrate into the tissue to reach the target tissue. We have to get there. Otherwise, nothing's gonna happen. But we have to get there and deliver the energy and penetrate the tissue in a safe way, safe manner. Check the ratings and the appropriate wavelength for the laser goggles, okay? Like we discussed before on the different ranges. Remember, only state boards can dictate how laser can be used on patients. The FDA is the laser device gatekeeper at the national level. They focus only on the safety and effectiveness, not on how it is used. It is illegal to claim FDA approved for a, with a laser that is FDA cleared via the, via the uh, 510K. Recommended resources, we have websites, uh, webinars, uh, fairly often, typically twice a month. So check on our, our website. I suggest uh, checking the website for the North American Association for Laser Therapy, or NOLTA, that uh, covers all the researchers and practitioners in lasers for laser therapy only, for Canada, US, and Mexico. And also strong, highly recommend this one, the World Association for Laser Therapy, the WALT. As the name implies, is is the, the extension to the NOLTA. It covers the whole world, and uh, that website has a lots of articles you can download, recommendation for protocol. They have tables for treatment protocols, recommended treatment protocols uh, for uh, super pulse lasers and a separate table for continuous wave lasers. They're, they're two different tables. They're not the same numbers. In terms of book, I recommend this book, Laser Phototherapy, written, uh, authors are Lars Hode, who you see his name right, right on the right side. The, uh, that's me on the left side. And Jan Tuner, both of them are researchers from Sweden. And uh, uh, in terms of the more of the technical side, 
uh, Dr. Tina Karu from Russia published this book, 10 Lectures on Basic Science of Laser, laser Photo Therapy. And that's what we have done for the laser therapy, the focus on the safety and regulations. Uh, again, uh, go back to the recommended resources if you want to pursue additional information. That's what we have for today. Uh, so let us know how we can support and help you in your uh, further in your education and practice of laser therapy. Goodbye. Thank you.